everyone. Good morning, evening, or afternoon, depending on where, where you're watching and, and participating at this Bright School edition. Um, my name is Bruna Martins de Santos. I am the Advocacy Coordinator at Data Privacy Brazil. And this session is facilitated by, um, by us. Uh, we are a Brazilian based nonprofit civil society organization created in 2020 that is focused on conducting, conducting research and advocacy on the intersection of technologies, use of data, and fundamental rights. Um, we are also based in an ethical funding and transparency policy, uh, and the association develops strategic research projects on personal data protection, mobilizing knowledge that can help regulators, judges, law professionals to deal with many complex questions that require deep knowledge about social technical systems that affect um, our rights. Um, this panel is also part of a project called Technical Authoritarianism in Brazil that started also in 2020, but in September and has been entirely dedicated to monitoring, identifying and advocating against the potential threats to civil rights, civil liberties and fundamental rights that um, are related to the use and sharing of personal data. Um, important to mention that this is also a joint project by LAUT Data Privacy Brazil and the Brazilian Bar Association. Um, our session today will be divided into a panel discussion and a Q&A part. Our panelists are um, Javier Fachero, Policy Director at Access Now, Rafael Zanata, my boss, Executive Director at Data Privacy Brazil Research, um, Jalak Kaká, Project Program Manager at the Center for Communication Government at the National Law University in Delhi, and Masa Ali Mardani, a researcher at the Oxford Internet Institute and also at Article 19. Um, for us to start our discussion, um, I'd like to start by saying that techno authoritarianism is on the rise and that is undeniable. Every single day we are watching governments deploy invasive technologies for the purposes of societal control. And on that, we have a short video to present to you. So um, if we can start the video now, that is our cue. É a possibilidade de você ter ferramentas do Estado baseadas em tecnologia que promovam aí é, uma coleta massiva e indiscriminada é, de dados dos usuários e o uso desses dados para é, ferramentas de controle é, social, controle do cidadão. São principalmente as práticas que fazem com que os governos sejam opacos aos seus cidadãos e os cidadãos sejam transparentes aos governos. A gente, quando é, pensa nas práticas que podem gerar resultados autoritários, nem sempre essas práticas estão fundadas em uma ideia de autoritarismo ou em uma intenção de diminuir o espaço democrático, de prejudicar os direitos, a associação entre os cidadãos. A informação para a política pública ela é muito importante, muito, 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 muito crucial. Quando eu tenho um governo com é, viés autoritário, eu deixo de confiar que ele vai lidar bem com essa informação. Tem uma visão muito da eficiência, né? porque eles querem cortar custo, que eles querem ó, diminuir as filas, esse ganho de eficiência. É, na verdade, às vezes, muitas vezes, mascarar um processo e desconsiderando as características de um arranjo democrático. Cada vez mais essas tecnologias permitem que um lado as utilize e que o outro lado não tenha condições efetivas de averiguar o que está acontecendo. A tecnologia digital ela pode ser uma tecnologia libertadora ou ela pode ser uma tecnologia de aprisionamento, uma tecnologia de vigilância ou de censura. A gente tem caminhado cada vez para um Estado, para um estado e para uma tecnologia não libertadora, mas que aprisiona. Nessa sociedade que a gente está vivendo, marcada pelo medo, as pessoas tendem a entregar sua liberdade com muito mais facilidade e legitimar a presença é, desses mecanismos de controle e coação imaginando que não vão ser prejudicadas com isso. A ideia de controle, de um controle unificado, de um acesso geral, é, a partir de agora ninguém mais tem individualidade, privacidade. Ela, ela vai atacar vários direitos. Eu posso ter isso como um instrumento de silêncio. 
né? Eu posso ter isso como instrumento é, de controle. Então não tem como você desconectar é, proteção de dados com os direitos fundamentais. É uma forma de proteção do indivíduo em relação ao Estado, da sociedade civil, da sociedade, em relação ao Estado, tem limitações. E essas limitações uh, são as necessárias para que a gente possa viver num mundo uh, de humanidade. everybody got the chance to see the video and read um the all, all the the little the little letters on the screen but um this is a video that um we gathered a huge part of the digital rights community here in brazil and and these are like other than just being friends are really relevant partners to our project so um also taking the time to thank everybody for being part of this video and and our conversation so um Starting the panel discussion, um, maybe we can do a little explanation here. Um, we start by saying that technologies can enable democratic and both democratic and authoritarian contexts. Um, the concept of techno authoritarianism in our project um, is being used to explain the expansion of state powers through the use of information communication technologies with the objective of increasing surveillance and control capabilities on the population resulting in amplified risks and violations to fundamental rights. Um, over the past few years, um, both governments and authoritarian actors all over the world are increasing their reliance on personal sensitive information under the banner of improving public policies and services. The result, which at least it, this is the result that we are investigating right now, is the widespread use of biometric data, including for mandatory identity cards, facial recognition in combination with the monitoring of public spaces, centralized databases of citizens' personal data, Brazil is huge on that right now, um, and among other technologies and practices. Um, we have a stellar panel with participants and activists from all over the world. I'm really happy and honored to have you all here. And um, for us to kick off this discussion, I would like to ask you all the same questions the, from our video. Um, what characterizes techno authoritarianism to you and do you think it can be solely approached as a disproportional use of personal data by governments um i think we can start this discussion with rafael and then massa and then I'll, i'll move on to the next speaker so Rafa, you have the word thanks bruno and, and thank you all for for being here with us it's a true pleasure to organize this session at rightscon i think this is a very important and old question bruna It really relates to the political philosophy of technology, like Herbert Marcuse many, many years ago talked about technology enabling democratic and authoritarian contexts. And I think it's extremely important right now to move beyond traditional divisions between what is a democracy and what is an authoritarian government. We are truly interested in authoritarian practices that occur within democracies. So it's not only about China, it's happening in Brazil, it happened in the US, happening in established democracies. And we've been investigating as well what the philosopher Ivan Salinger talks about the oppressive character of certain types of technologies. For instance, facial recognition or unified databases, they allowed for an increased level of oppression of fundamental rights. So there is also this particular phenomenon of the, the type of the technology and how it connects with certain types of authoritarian practices. Uh, what we saw in Brazil as some elements of this attempt to describe this phenomenon is uh, three really concerning practices, authoritarian practices. First of all, is the abuse, abusive data sharing. So getting data, for instance, biometric data from driver's licenses and trying to move to another department within the government and changing the purpose of the use of the data. Or illegal forms of digital dossiers 
in which they might allow for inference of political data, but they are not like direct processing of sensitive data. They are more sophisticated than that. And they use softwares and technologies to aggregate huge uh, amounts of public data, so they speak, in order to allow a mechanism to control the movements of activists and citizens. And the third element, which is, which is extremely concerning, is the deployment of technology and turning the intelligence apparatus against the citizens. And this is truly horrifying in Brazil. Brazil uh, uses the intelligence community and some of the intelligence system not to monitor terrorist attacks or foreign attacks or uh, threats from the outside, but it's con constantly turning inside. We have this project together with Laut, which is a research center on liberty and authoritarianism, and the director of this research center has been constantly attacked by the militaries on Twitter, and there's a criminal investigation against him for making public comments and, and criticizing the government. So they turn this apparatus to monitor who are the digital influencers, who are the academics or the scholars that are threatening the government. So this is a, a part of the phenomenon. So I would say that in a nutshell, it's, it's not only about the abusive use of data. Certainly it is an important element, but I think the concept goes beyond. There are other important elements to describe what is technical authoritarianism. Thank you very much. Um, Massa, I'm gonna direct the same question to you. Is it only about data or what else can be part of techno authoritarianism? Um, I mean, the concept of techno authoritarianism is very uh, interesting, especially, I guess, in you know, the MENA region, especially when you look at you know, the country that I specialize in and follow very closely, which is Iran. And I mean, Iran was kind of the birthplace of a concept that now has been largely unpacked as um, a faulty uh, conception, which is the conception of liberation technology. And liberation technology was a term uh, coined by Larry Diamond in 2010 after um, the 2009 Green Movement in Iran, where many people, you know, falsely accuse it of being a Twitter revolution. And so that conception was really based on the fact that we now had these liberating potentials of the internet bringing um, you know, access to communications, access to information um, to citizens and internet users who before couldn't necessarily have access to, the, to that kind of online public sphere that the internet was bringing because these authoritarian governments were controlling that sphere. Um, and you know, 10 years on, 11 years on, we know that that is um, you know, techno authoritarianism might be a much more logical way of conceiving of what the internet's potentials can be. And that, that might be a cynical way of looking at it. I mean, in the case of Iran, um, since, you know, the potentials of the internet in mobilizing and, you know, facilitating protests has been recognized by the, you know, Islamic Republic of Iran, which, you know, I have to say is not the same political system as Brazil. It is a very, um, I guess it's a very unique political system in that it's an Islamic theocracy. And by all accounts, um, it is characterized as an authoritarian regime or semi-authoritarian regime um, because of its political context. And much of the policies that are in place within the Islamic Republic of Iran is to not only control the data of users, but to control what kind of content um, is placed in front of users. And so, um, I mean, it's a very big and important part of what's happening in Iran. And there's been a lot of different um, policies and movements that is about, you know, the centralization of data that there's a really big project in Iran called the National Information Network, which is about centralizing the infrastructure um, and basically control over the internet to the Iranian authorities. Um, they package it as protecting uh, data from, you know, Western uh, governments or Western enemies. Um, but that is one of the core, core, I guess, realities of the internet and Iran, and it is very much so about uh, data centralization. But 
more importantly, it's about um, access to information and more and more, there are more hurdles to access to information and the way that, you know, users have their data protected. Um, and I, I guess that's kind of um, the techno authoritarianism that's a reality in, I guess, a very much so authoritarian context like Iran. Thank you very much, Masa. And um, moving on to Jalak right now, I think um, Masa touched on a point that is very relevant to us, that is access. And I think that um, access can be restricted both um, in terms of information and, or, and also to services. And I think um, India has become um, rather, um, not, I'm not gonna say famous, but it has been an example, the, the Aadhaar case and, and in terms of access to public services and, and, and to welfare as well. So um, Jalek, um, the same question to you, um, is techno authoritarianism simply about the use of personal data or what else can you add to this conversation? Thanks, Bruna. Um, I think before we really start talking about techno authoritarianism, and you know, um, I think maybe useful to remember that technology and evolution of technology in various ways and at various stages of human civilization has had significant implications on the way our societies have been structured and functioned. Right. Um, so every leap in technology that human, the human race has seen, has raised new challenges to notions of democracy, equality, speech, privacy in our societies. And, and in a sense, what we're seeing is, is no different from what has come before. So I think we have to really look back and see what has come before and what we can learn from that. And maybe what we can avoid in, in what we've done previously to address these sort of situations. So we have to you know, really grapple and adapt to ensure that our societies continue to be founded on principles of democracy, equity, rule of law. And I mean, if you think about the electricity and steam power revolution that, that came uh, about, um, and it brought forth industrialization, which, which has got a great deal of development and progress, but it's also brought about a tremendous amount of inequality in our societies. And, and various steps have been taken, various, you know, Proposals have been put forth uh, to try to overcome these challenges. And, and similarly, the technology and internet revolution has brought forth untold benefits to our society. But it's all, you know, uh, it's, it's brought about inclusion in many ways, you know, in the Indian context, access to information in rural villages, which otherwise, you know, where information would not reach today, you know, people with a simple, cheap smartphone and you know, 2G, 3G access to the internet are able to access a lot of information about government benefits, about their rights, uh, get information out there when, you know, troubling situations arise. But it's also given rise to many negative external externalities. And I think we have to think about as a society, how do we reconfigure and calibrate governance and regulatory mechanisms to really deal with these emerging challenges. And I think we're on the cusp of the AI revolution, or we're probably already in the midst of an AI re revolution that's commenced. Um, and, and, and these concerns are just going to get exacerbated. Concerns around tech authoritarianism. And, and I think we really have to, you know, I think this panel is extremely timely in that sense. And we really need to take stock and understand what we need to adapt and how we need to respond to these situations to live in a world that continues to be grounded in democracy and human rights. And, um, we need to be careful because otherwise we're going to have higher levels of exclusion in society, the kind of exclusion that comes from, you know, programs like Aadhaar being used for delivery of social and, you know, government benefits. We're going to see higher levels of inequality, violations of our rights to speech, privacy, and other sort of negative impacts on democracy. And I think increasingly across the globe, we're seeing countries uh, relying on national, emerging national security situations or situations related to, you know, COVID-19 setting up surveillance frameworks, health surveillance frameworks, law enforcement surveillance frameworks, and even, as you mentioned, relatively benign, you know, frameworks, which are relatively benign in the sense their objective is to enhance public service delivery, but then how function creep comes about and, and these, you know, systems are used for a lot more and integrated with other law enforcement systems, which, which give rise to sort of some kind, you know, which gives rise to a lot of concerns around privacy, tracking of individuals. And I think the challenge is that the link to the average citizen 
of this kind of datafication of us as individuals and the impact that the, the solid negative impact that this can have on our society is not always very clear. It, it's not a very tangible you know, concept for them to understand. And I think that is some a role that we working in civil society organizations, academic organizations, advocacy and grassroots organizations need to come together and find ways to address because um, until this sort of realization is brought about, about the impacts of datafication on our society, um, you know, we'll not be able to sort of start to address uh, the challenges they pose. And I think, you know, Bruna, you're rightly saying, of course, data is one key element of techno authoritarianism. There's no doubt about it, but I think it's about a lot more. It's about regulatory control being exercised by governments around the world, around media and internet platforms, um, and other mechanisms of public discourse. And we see that playing out in every single region of the world, whether you take Southeast Asia, or you take South Asia, you take Latin America, you take the US. I mean, interestingly, um, over the last couple of years, year after year, we've seen in the United States, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, and Japan repeatedly calling for backdoor access to encrypted platforms to allow law enforcement agencies to access end-to-end -end encrypted communication. And, you know, these are all democracies of the world, like, uh, you know, so, um, you know, as, as you rightly said, this is not about the distinction between authoritarian governments and democratic societies and governments, but it's about these sort of challenges that are coming up within our uh, democratic societies. And I, I think we really need to pay attention to the threats that these pose to uh, the kind of life and human rights values that we seek to embed in our societies. Thank you very much, um, Jalak. And I think you also touched on a very relevant point that is um, this um, movement around control and, and, and to what extent data does um, feed into this movement and feeds into all of this intense and governmental uh, movement into controlling society further and, and exercising it through regulatory means or even um, any other uh, means that are possible. Um, so. Moving on um, the question to Javier as well, and, and then um, maybe asking that um, he can also reply to that on a more global level. And um, since access now has been part of um, so many of these global processes around um, data use and human rights and so on. Um, Javi, same question to you. What can be techno authoritarianism? And um, do you think it can be solely approached as the disproportional use of data? Yeah, so um, the good thing of going uh, last is that I can just echo uh, what everyone else said. Uh, I think there were very good interventions and ideas around what uh, authoritarianism means. Um, I would agree with most of the of my fellow panelists here that uh, this goes well beyond the misuse of data or the disproportionate use of data. Um, so whenever we think about proportionate or disproportionate uses of data, we sometimes should, I think, um, consider you know, whatever is unnecessary use of information or dangerous or harmful practices in general. Uh, I think that the way in which, for example, India has, has uh, come to digitalization through Aadhaar, for example, as, as Jalak just mentioned, is a very good example of how something can go well beyond the initial considerations around data or necessity and proportionality toward the, a whole of range of, of how government uses its power, which is, I think, the, the question in the, in the basis of it. And I think that it's important to, for us to understand that there are legitimate use cases for information from, from users uh, or citizens, let's say, right? Uh, because it goes well beyond whomever uses the technology at hand. It also affects everyone. Uh, but for example, thinking of the pandemic in itself, you know, and how you use health data, how you can aggregate um, uh, data about tracing or people's movements or health data in general to, to research uh, the way in which uh, you know the pandemic is 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 affecting people and so on. That is, I think, uh, one case of a legitimate use of of information. So, how can we uh, come at this conundrum? How to use information when it's necessary in a way that is not authoritarian, right? Um, I think that that maybe one thing that comes to mind is thinking of authoritarianism as 
uh, uh, think about objectives. If the objective, you know, aside or beside whatever the government says is about control, about surveillance, right? Instead of the protection of, right, of rights, that's how authoritarianism looks like. Authoritarianism looks like control and surveillance. It's not about the protection of rights. Democracy is about the protection of rights. And speaking of democracy, right, uh, there's also a concept that needs to be, um, you know, um, specified a little bit more. We sometimes think of legitimacy in terms of democracy as only legitimacy of origin, meaning that we consider something to be democratic and appropriate if it has been voted by lawmakers, and that's it, which is a good consideration, but this only deals with the leg legitimacy of origin, okay? Democracy and proper rule of law is about legitimacy of exercise as well, meaning that it is not, that does not only require laws that are voted by Congress or even, you know, supported by people, but also requires institutions, checks and balances, requires compatibility with international human rights law and several other considerations. So it's not only about having a law that was voted by the parliament or by the Congress. It's about how you do the exercise with checks and balances and how you integrate obligations, right? That states have under international human rights law in the implementation of anything that the government does, okay? So that's how real, true democratic governance looks like. And that's what legitimacy looks like. And going to the, to the strategies, you know, uh, of, of maybe what can be done, right? To, 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 to counter digital authoritarianism. I can think of, of, of three main uh, strategies, just uh, you know, quickly. One of them is adding complexity to the analysis, right? We sometimes, uh, even us at civil society, um, you know, or, or academics or whatever, tend to be deterministic or reductionist in some of the analysis that we do when we speak about data protection or when we speak about the dangers of technology or the dangers of big data and so on. Remember the Cambridge Analytica scandal and how a lot of people jumped to conclusions and generated a certain amount of panic. I mean, it was not generated by civil society, I would say, but um, it was, let's say, not contested by academics and by civil society, this panic, right? And this panic served the purpose of several authoritarian governments around the world to just go with very wide knee-jerk reactions and bad regulations that ended up affecting rights. And that's what we're seeing now. It's not the only cause, but what I mean is that the narratives are also to be shaped by us. And we have a responsibility to help shape them in a way that they diminish the surface of attack for those who want to twist our words, you know, and use the legislation and protections that we are pushing for against us, right? So complexity in the analysis, point number one. Point number two as a strategy, I would say that we need to push for policies that enable decentralization, interoperability, community networks, you know, that kind of thing. All policies that actually have autonomy and control for the user and for the communities at its heart. So how do you give more control to users and communities, which is the base, the basis of legitimacy and democratic governance? Okay, through decentralization, through community networks. The issue of encryption, I think, is very important as well in the, in the sense that it gives the user a technical tool to exert control over privacy of their own communications and so on. So any technology that actually empowers users and communities creates a less surface of attack for an authoritarian government. If we rely only on the big tech company that is the dominant player, the government has one or maybe two, three, four points of attack and that's it and we are done. Okay, so I think it's very interesting to think of technologies that are actually make it hard, uh, you know, make, make censorship and abuse harder. Data, the, the issue of data, for example, data compartmentalization, minimization, uh, you know, federated approaches to, to things like digital ID, you know, so, th so those are several ideas that go in the same direction. And finally, super, super quick, sorry, sorry for taking too much. I think that the third point would be better coordination. Uh, for civil society and academics and international fora, okay? There are forums like the ITU, the UN, the G7, and several others, the OECD, the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, everyone is doing things, uh, you know, that aim at centralization of information, control, and, and that kind of thing. And those processes are not uh, very much contested by civil society and academics, sometimes because they are very hard to 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 get and to join, but we also need to find ways to coordinate better and to go and knock on those doors, right? Just to make our, our voices heard. Uh, that's it, thanks. 
Thank you very much, Javi, and thank you also for um, bringing up our next discussions. And, and just before I, I direct all of you the our next question, I, I think um, that was our main idea for this panel to highlight that techno authoritarianism really goes beyond um, the misuse of data and is something that um, relies on um, governments or states' ideas of exercising more control over citizens and also this, this difference with democracy being um, the space in which we have the full exercise of rights. Um, and just to agree with some of Javi's points as well, I do think it's also about empowering citizens and um, creating those less points of attack, um, either by uh, civil society coordination, either by more capacity building for citizens and so forth. So um, my next question to you is that, um, is the following. Um, over the past years, we have seen um, an increased number of tech-enabled um, human rights abuses performed by governments. And um, maybe from the civil society perspective and looking into the future, what can be the strategies that we can adopt um, in order to be able to resist the rise of techno-authoritarianism? And um, what other resistance strategies can be taken on by stakeholders if we want to move beyond um, just the civil society coordination level. So um, I'm going to follow the same order, um, Rafael, and then Massa, and then Jalak, and Javi um, last. So Rafa, you have the floor. Thanks. This is a very tough question and a very important one. Um, there are many strategies and options. I think one of them, we've been engaged in that, is a kind of a cultural battle. I mean trying to reshape values and co culture within countries and jurisdictions, because many people there are supportive of authoritarian practices. Uh, the psychology of the masses explain that people feel comfortable when there is a strong authoritarian leader. So it's actually quite challenging to, to uh, defend democratic values and autonomy and self-determination. We've been trying to do that through podcasts, uh, magazines and partnerships with journalists that are being constantly attacked in Brazil, trying to produce materials to YouTubers or digital influencers and even TV shows. Uh, so trying to spread the idea from outside the NGO, from outside, um, outside the boundaries of our think tanks and digital rights community. The second one is a strong partnership with lawyers and the Brazilian Bar Association has been crucial in this project because we can coordinate strategic litigations at the Supreme Court. And we are working as amicus curi in very important cases. We participate in, in the case about data sharing from telecommunications companies to the government last year. We participated now in the Cadastro Basi case, which is a unified database that is being constitutionally challenged. And we are working on a new case about uh, public bids and procurements of softwares like NSO and Multego softwares and others that are can be used to spy on people. And I really appreciate having this conversation and, and listening to listening to Jalak and Javi and others because I think we are about to really build a global strategy of sharing resources, uh, understanding different cases from different countries, understanding the similarities between countries that are um, different in their context, but are, rep are presenting the same elements of techno-authoritarianism and, and also to learn from each other and to build a more a stronger uh, approach of resistance in a, in a digital uh, global civil society. And for that to occur, we certainly need resources. We need the support of funders. We need people uh, supporting these projects, uh, otherwise they will just vanish. And I think one of the biggest challenges is maybe is cross-regional collaborations. Uh, sometimes we became too attached to our own regions, but I think it's a really powerful idea if we can do more and collaborate more and strategize more in a cross-regional perspective. So I think these are some of the ideas that we've been thinking here in Brazil. And would love to collaborate and do more uh, with you guys. Thanks, Hafa. Um, Massa, so Hafa mentioned um, some things like um, creative discomfort and raising awareness, partnership to foster litigation strategies, and 
other global strategies um, in the world. So what would you add to this list as well? What, and, and what other ways can we resist to the rise of techno authoritarianism? Um, I mean, in the context of a country like Iran, which is, like I said before, quite unique and isolated, it's quite hard. I mean, one of the things that we and a lot of people in the digital rights community who work on internet shutdowns, for example, work on is, you know, asserting internet shutdowns as more and more of a norm to shame and stop countries from committing that action um, as a human rights abuse. And, you know, it's, it's, it is somewhat of a norm um, with different resolutions at the Human Rights Council, but obviously it is not a law, there's no treaty, and there are certain international mechanisms that still um, allow for governments to, you know, commit, you know, the abuse of an internet shutdown for um, national security reasons. I mean, there's, um, there's articles within the ITU convention, which as you all know, is part of the United Nations, um, Iran often uses for this. I mean, but there are, I mean, Article 19 has a whole, um, and I'm sure Access Now as well, has a whole program dedicated to working within the UN mechanisms to work with different states to put pressure. Um, I mean, Brazil used to be a state that we used to look to to put pressure on Iran within the Human Rights Council, for example, because Brazil used to have a strong digital rights mandate, at least um, before this current government um, within that forum. Um, another thing that we have been working on um, in terms of Iran's techno-authoritarianism is um, just the kind of isolation that occurs within, um, you know, internationally occurs against Iran. And so, you know, as um, many of you might know, there's a whole sanctions regime placed against Iran. Um, and we are working on, you know, the U.S. government being much clearer um, and working with different companies to remove, um, you know, overcompliant uh, sanctions that block certain technologies from being used by Iranian users that, you know, helps um, users go on to, you know, national uh, platforms that obviously have lots of compromises and restrictions on them. Um, but in a larger sense, that kind of isolation um, that many different countries that are, you know, um, committing techno authoritarianism are under kind of helps facilitate it. So, you know, the, the isolation that a country like Iran is under with sanctions helps facilitate um, what the government essentially wants, which is a national information network that is quite kind of separated from the rest of the world. Um, for a period of time, Iran was pursuing a data protection law. Um, because of different political elements, this has been sidelined in Iran. But at that time, a lot of us were hopeful that because Iran was taking this step, um, it could follow along with a lot of other countries that were trying to seek, um, you know, adequacy licenses from the EU to be, uh, you know, potential partners um, in data sharing agreements with the EU. And they would, you know, try to align or, um, for make more robust laws and reform their um, various problematic restrictions and uh, come in line with international standards. Not to say that the EU's GDPR is perfect or any country has perfect international standards, but there was this, there is this hope of more cooperation internationally could aid um, in better circumstances like that. Great, um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so Jalak, um, on this group as well, what would you add beyond um, fostering cooperation instances and um, allowing states to be more human rights compliant and, and things um, related to that? So the floor is yours. Thanks, Runa. Um, I think, uh, you know, picking up on some of the points that um, Rafa, Masa, and Javier and me till now. Um, I think one of the things that Rafa said is, you know, it links back to shifting cultural norms and building an understanding, rebuilding an understanding of what is okay and not okay in a changed circumstance in society. So I think going back and building understanding and visibility on these issues within our society and creating a sort of acceptance that 
things need to change and that there is a problem, I think is a is sort of a key starting step for advocacy and grassroots organizations to sort of help us do. Um, I think on the other level, you know, for more academic organizations, what would be useful for them to do is underlining international obligations for um, governments to be adhering to and tracking global developments and sort of creating resources where we can all learn from each other, right? Like, for instance, this conversation is one such resource where we can all learn from each other. The other day I was talking to Rafa um, in, you know, when we were discussing this panel and, and he mentioned to me how the right to data protection in the Brazilian constitution is interpreted and flows not only out of the right to privacy, but actually from a reading of the right to liberty alongside uh, the right to dignity. And I thought that was very interesting and you know, uh, would be an interesting perspective to deploy as you know, these kind of conversations happen in constitutional courts um, around the world. And you know, that's one of the things that uh, we've been trying to do at the Center for Communication Governance at the National Law University in Delhi where you know, we, build, we are building out a privacy law library where we're tracking global jurisprudence and developments around privacy and you know, creating case briefs so that you know, prof academics, professionals, researchers, activists, advocates can go and use these resources, understand how different countries and governments, these kind of conversations are playing out because I think uh, findings in constitutional courts are, you know, a real reflection of what's happening in, in societies. And we tend to see a lot of reporting around um, what's, what's working, what's not working, what governments are doing, but, uh, you know, we have to dig deeper for these kind of things. And I think the last point, uh, you know, would be coalition building of civil society organizations and engagement between academic organizations, civil society organizations, and private sector organizations. And, I think, you know, Masa has been talking about that kind of engagement with private sector organizations and, you know, seeing how we can keep the dialogue going, how we can leverage the unique position of different organizations and stakeholders in our societies to impact this space. For instance, you know, when I was at Harvard Law School, um, I saw the way the law school clinics played a very unique role in bringing together civil society organizations, human rights defenders, lawyers to prepare for a strategy around a case, which constitutional court forum should they approach? How can they pool resources to research and argue cases? You know, even in high resource contexts like the US, civil society resources are limited. And I think we have to learn to sort of come together and work together. And very often I see that that's not the case with civil society organizations. There's, you know, um, and I, I think that's, you know, it's it's an important thing to work towards is, is finding and building those coalitions. And I think, you know, from the perspective of the global South and developing countries, and when I speak to, you know, friends and peers working on these issues across these countries, something that we see is, there's anyways a dearth of human rights lawyers working on these kinds of cases in courts. And certainly a very small percentage of those who specialize on digital rights issues. And we need to find ways to increase the number of people working on these issues and enhance capacity of human rights lawyers working on these issues. Because um, I think techno-authoritarianism is so much more than just traditional notions and understandings of right to privacy or right to freedom of speech and expression. And I think human rights lawyers, constitutional lawyers, young lawyers in this space need to appreciate the unique challenges that technology and the digital space pose to democratic societies. And, um, and I think, you know, we as civil society organizations, funder organizations in this space need to think about how we can actively sort of create that next generation of lawyers who have the capacity to you know, really engage with these issues and uh, you know, drive change and impact in this space. Great, um, Jalak. And just to mention that um, we're definitely aligned with the idea of creating the next generation of lawyers. We do, at least in Brazil, we have seen um, a rate, an increasing number of 
data protection lawyers, but we do think that there, there has to be more um, space for this intersection between um, human rights, technology, and data protection as well, because they tend to be discussed differently and separately. So um, we're definitely aligned with that. And um, maybe direct, just directing this question to Javi as well. We have spoken about coalition building, um, grassroots advocacy. Javi, what else do you have to add? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I agree with what was said as well. Um, I, in the previous intervention, I focused on the complexity of the analysis, the uh, push for policies that aim at decentralization and having more control for users and communities, and, and also the better coordination on the international front. One more thing that I could mention to this is to um, try to see how we can rebuild the communication and interaction with private sector, especially with companies that are now being part, uh, being subject to pressure from governments, right? Uh, as we know, uh, private platforms, particularly social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, but mo mostly Facebook, have failed civil society spectacularly on, on some fronts. Uh, the examples of Colombia, uh, India recently, uh, uh, of um, of also Palestine, you know, we, we have seen uh, a, a true uh, lack of transparency. We have seen issues there. We have seen, uh, uh, you know, not a, not a very understandable commitment about uh, interacting with civil society. Nevertheless, uh, platforms should resist the urge and, uh, and the temptation of, uh, you know, striking some kind of deal. I'm not saying that there's like a, a explicit deal with, with governments, right? But giving in to governments that increasingly, you know, try to force authoritarian practices on companies. So companies will become in the end agents of the government. That is something that needs to be resisted. And I think that platforms need to, you know, renew their commitment with civil society. And we need to also get together with a clear, strong message uh, you know, to try to find the space for assistance there. I mean, I, I, I can remember now the example in Brazil about this, this person from, from, from Facebook uh, that was detained uh, out, out of, a, of a temporary order by a local judge, if I remember correctly. So if you see this trend, it's actually an old trend that's going harder, you know, we now have the, the issue with Twitter in India where they're asking for, for you know, for the, for the local office and so on. So that kind of thing, I think is very worrying. And, um, and, and even though there are legitimate reasons, as I said before, the trend toward authoritarianism that is shown by the practices and processes needs to be addressed. And I think that civil society needs to, we need to build the bridge again. You know, some of these things need to be coordinated with platforms. Um, how we're, are we gonna do it? I don't know. There's a social hour with companies on Friday in RiceCon. Join, go to the social hour with companies. You get a unique chance to speak to them face to face. Um, but I think that there's also an, an element to add. Thanks, Javi, um, and, and definitely 100%. I, I was, as you all, were all speaking, I was wondering that maybe for next year, we can do a strategy session in our community lab, coming back to this topic and then like going one year back and seeing how can we um, strengthen these um, compromises and, and discussions. We have one question on the chat. Um, it's from Eduardo Costa. Um, and maybe, I, I don't know if any of you would like to respond, but the question is, um, is it possible to use technologies that are commonly used to surveil and, 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 like, and bring techno authoritarianism to a proper purposes? Or um, these tags should be banned? I'm gonna post this on our internal chat, um, but this is, um, this is it. I'm not sure if you guys understood me or if anyone would like to take um, this question. Sure. Uh, I mean, this is, it's important to, to recognize that the increase of surveillance, it's a structural phenomena of the advancements of societies. And in certain areas, it is okay and it is reasonable to employ that. For instance, in many medical centers in Brazil uh, regarding COVID, there is an increase of partnerships between the public sector, hospitals, and private firms in order to monitor the advancement of this disease, which is quite complex and unknown for many people. And are, there are some good choices of employment of technologies, such as decentralized contact tracing, as long as you have accountability demonstrations of the documents and the 
participation of the community. We have published a long report about that. I mean, how to correctly use personal data and technology in the context of COVID, of the pandemics. Uh, there are other, on the other hand, of course, there is an increased discussion about a moral contestation of certain types of markets. For instance, in my personal opinion, the business model of Clearville AI, it's completely unlawful and morally contested, should be banned. In my view, certain types of biometric surveillance, as we are defending in the public campaign that was launched this week by Access Now and EDAC and many other NGOs, they should also be banned. So it's very hard to talk on the general level. Uh, we, we need to go to specific contexts and to specific scenarios on what is the reason and the deployment of technology. Uh, it's very hard to answer if certain types of, should be banned from the outset or not. But of course, there is a vast field of moral contestation of certain types of markets of surveillance going on. Thank you very much, Hafa. Um, Massa, Javi, Jalak, any additional points to this question? Okay. Um, maybe I, I'm just going to highlight um, that um, Adriano Mancinelli also posted on the chat that um, the Thomson Reuters Foundation runs Trust Law, which is a global legal pro bono service that has been supporting similar work, um, including on procurement laws. And um, they would like to maybe follow up with us on this um, conversation as well. So that's um, another um, good um, person for us to chat and discuss. So um, maybe I would like to give you all um, the opportunity of adding any last points to that, to this discussion, any um, last words or tweets um, from any of you on how we should um, evolve this conversation for next year or even for the coming future. Um, I'm gonna do the last round um, on the same order. So Rafael, Massa, um, Jalak and Javi. So one last tweet, what do you wanna say to the RightsCon community, Hafe? We just published today this report on techno authoritarianism in Brazil with many examples. So let's please continue the conversation and build from other examples and jurisdictions. I really love the conversation and what Massa said, Javi, and I think we should collaborate on existing platforms such as the one that Jalak is conducting on monitoring what is the meaning of personal data protection as a fundamental right. I think it's a very powerful legal tool for us. And if anyone wants to continue the conversation, we are totally available to do that. And thanks, Bruno, for conducting this session. Yeah. yeah, one of the things that I really enjoy about generally being part of the digital rights community is, is that the separation, like the geopolitical separations between different countries and the politics that separate them doesn't often configure into how we, we deal with techno authoritarianism. So um, this community can be battling what Facebook is doing to Palestine and similarly can be condemning um, you know, the restrictive structures that exist within Iran or within Brazil um, without any of the conflicts and divisions that often come into place when uh, talking about resistance in these different contexts. So um, more of these synergies, and I guess what you guys are doing is very much essential to understanding that this is part of the same movement, what's happening in each of these countries, even though it's manifesting in different ways and might have different meanings and different uh, implementations, um, especially by the governments. Um, but essentially, uh, we should all be working together to condemn uh, these practices and abuses. Thank you, Masa. Jalak? I think taking from Masa's point um, about how, you know, traditional borders and, you know, geopolitical differences don't come into play. In fact, I think digital rights is a space where because of the way the internet is structured because of, you know, the fact that we have these large internet platforms that are, you know, accessible and used by people all across the world, it's actually a very unique sort of regulatory governance situation 
where if we sort of come together and uh, you know really talk about these issues, build strategy around these issues, we can really move the needle and have an impact because unlike a lot of other issues which are very particular to you know certain countries or regions, I think this is definitely an issue where there's a lot of um, similarity in 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 across the globe, and of course, each you know country has its cultural context in terms of what content would be okay to be on like a Facebook or a Twitter and what won't. But I think there's more room for sort of commonality here, um, and I think we we must draw on that and come together and discuss these issues and work on these issues together to push back the tide or the rising tide on techno authoritarianism. Thank you, Jalak. Javi, what's your tweet? Um, besides what I said, I think that the Digital Rights Litigators Network, for example, is a good uh, place uh, to get people connected. Um, so we can share more about that in, in uh, communications in Twitter. I mean, there, there's a lot of room for, for coordination, but I would I have nothing substantial to add to what was already said. Uh, also mindful of time so thank you and thanks bruna for this uh, great coordination this session oh no thanks to all of you and thanks to the 141 people still watching us right now so this i mean on behalf of data privacy research i i thank you all to our panelists and and also to our audience this was a really interesting discussion and um if anyone wants to take this to um twitter or anything else please um take a look and reach out to us. We are at um, Data Privacy BR and um, let's continue this conversation. So thank you, Jalak, Masa, Javi and Hafa for, for today. Bye-bye everyone. <laughs>